All right, we're recording. Now there's even costume changes, yes. Uh, hello again, this is Trent. For another episode of Maps, if you will. Um, just to start off, this is a little throwback to the second show we did, um, where I was talking about this idea of a function sequencer. Um, I got it working, it required fixing a bug in Crow. Um, we'll get a new release out very soon that includes it. Um, but just to, I mean, maybe you can already hear it, but uh, basically, we have, where are we? We have a bunch of functions up here. They're all pretty simple. Um, they're like nice little neat functions. But um, they basically can get called on like a timeline. Um, and down here I have a, a table that I called timeline. Uh, and it basically is a, a list of um, times. These are like timestamps. Um, it starts at time zero, and it will go to whatever the last line is. Um, in this case, our last line is a fancy function that jumps back to the first line. Um, and our first line is a function that does nothing, but it's just like a terminal, so we can kind of know where we're going to. Um, and everything else is basically just a, a nice little list of actions. Um, yeah, and so the idea is you can kind of sequence through them. I think the cool thing is that um, when you do it this way, you can like these functions can be stateful, meaning they can they can interact with each other depending on which order you call them in. They're not just notes in a sequence; they they have a time effect. Um, I don't know if I should go this way, a time effect, uh, so that you have a sequence that sequences timed events. And to me, at least, it's uh, it's been enjoyable to kind of play with, even if the music's a little whatever for now. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to show that. I'll share that on the uh, on the gist after this, just so everybody can check it out if they want to see how it works. Um, but yeah, so oh, I'm clipping again. Sorry, everyone. Um, this week is about harmonics. And subharmonics. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if people saw it, but Moog came out with a new synthesizer. They, yeah, they, it's been shown before, but uh, they actually made it a thing. And so people have been talking about subharmonics a bit. Um, and I, it's an idea and an, an interesting idea that I've kind of been playing with and experimenting with for a number of years now. Um, so I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about it. Um, and use it as a jumping off point to talk a little bit about just intonation, um, which I have dabbled with a lot, but I haven't actually made any real music with it. Um, so maybe today we can make something that can make some nice music. Um, but yeah, as always, let me know in the comments. Wait. Comments. Um, if you have any questions, you can do at Trentley, um, it'll kind of show up nice and bright so I can see what you're trying to say. Um, yeah, if you have comments or questions or things you want to explore later in the, um, later in the show, um, the show, is it a show? If this is your entertainment, I don't even know. Um, yeah, so I've got coffee. I have my notes, which are now hiding under my computer. Sorry. Would you believe? I'm actually prepared. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is basically just talk about overtones and overtones or harmonics. Um, I'm going to break this patch down really quickly. So today, there's going to be a lot of crow stuff still. Um, so we'll get it. We'll do like the scripting things over here. Um, but I'm also going to try just to kind of do modular things to use it a bit more to kind of explain some ideas. Um, but the first thing is to talk about harmonics, and I think the easiest way 
to think about them um, or to, to demonstrate them is just with a classic patch, an oscillator plugged into a filter. Um, and specifically an oscillator with a lot of harmonics um, plugged into a filter, usually a low pass filter, um, but you can actually, maybe a band pass will be more accurate uh, or more demonstrative. Uh, so we'll start with a, we're gonna use a mangrove and a three sisters cause it's what I have. Um, let's go into, oh, that'll make things easier. So at the moment, the filter's wide open. I'm just gonna dial in a kind of sawtooth sound. So that's just a, it's more or less a sawtooth. Um, I still haven't figured out the scope in this kind of setup, but um, you know, it looks like this. <laughs> a triangle on its side. Um, and we have it plugged into a low pass filter on three sisters. Just here. And then we can just turn down the frequency. Kind of has the classic effect of like rolling off all the high end. So that was a non-resonant filter. Um, so what we're gonna do is crank up the resonance to kind of hear um, hear the harmonics in play. Um, we might need to turn the frequency down a bit further, but let's try it as is. So this is the fundamental frequency of the oscillator. Um, and the hope is that as we turn the center frequency up, we're gonna hear an emphasis given to each of the harmonics of this tone. So I think I would call this the, the second harmonic, the octave up. So this is the fundamental, the octave, well, octave and a, uh, sorry, this is the octave, then we go to an octave and a fifth, two octaves up, and here there's a third, it's hiding in there, but it's, it's kind of in the background, and as we go up, the the, the um, those harmonics get closer and closer and closer together. It's difficult to get it. You have to get the filter just to the point of self oscillation, but not quite there. And then it helps if you turn down the oscillator's um, volume because it allows the the reinforcement of the resonance to kind of over to overpower the oscillator. At some point, you lose the ability to dial in exactly the harmonic. And we're going to try it with uh, with a band pass instead of a low pass. My hearing's not really good enough to distinguish the tones after about the, I guess this is the third octave. Um, just because they're so close together, it's hard to like really dial it in. The filter, this has a, a four pole filter and it's just not enough. You need like, two, like eight poles uh, and as you go higher even more um, to get that isolation.
so that's uh that's kind of the first way of kind of playing with harmonics and like really getting to explore that kind of territory and it, and those harmonics um they're typically kind of described as being more uh, consonant you know harmonious major sounding happy sounding and we'll come back to that stuff a bit later but that's kind of one way to think about them um another patch we can try is a sync patch and this also kind of plays with harmonics um so i'm gonna go back to low pass mode um i'm gonna open the filter up so, yeah, so that's a kind of sawtooth back again um I never know which way this goes, but basically we're going to use a second oscillator um, and we're just going to use a, a square wave um, to plug into the sync on the first mangrove. And this should give us um, the ability to kind of bring out overtones in a different, with a kind of different um, sound. Okay, so this is the original tone. Um, we'll start from that. When we plug in this, this second oscillator, it's going to change that frequency a little bit. But we can dial them back in together. So at the moment, I think these are playing the same octave. Um, but we're just using the square output on the mangrove, so it's just like a regular oscillator. It's only affected by the frequency. But from here, as we turn the frequency on the modulating oscillator, so we're, only, we're not even listening to this, we're just plugging it in as a modulation source, um, we should hear these different harmonics kind of fold over on top of the main oscillator. I got this wrong. We have to do it the other way around. <laughs> um, right. Okay, so that way you get this weird like frequency folding thing. But I think we actually need to change the frequency of the carrier oscillator. Um, but it will kind of stay locked in by the secondary oscillator. two octaves and as you go higher and higher they become increasingly difficult to dial in but the way it works is um, they kind of when you do that even though they're not there's no feedback happening there's a kind of uh, phenomenon where they kind of have this frequency locking behavior where you get really close to that being in tune, and then all of a sudden it becomes locked in and perfectly tuned and perfectly in tune, and it won't bounce out until you kind of move the frequency knob substantially. Um, so that's one sound. You get a lot more kind of junk in between the two. But that's something that you could sequence, you know, if you have like a good sequencer, you can dial in exactly the right frequencies um, on the, the main oscillator, the one you were listening to, the carrier, um, to just pull out those harmonics out of that one oscillator. Um, doing it by hand, obviously, you're going to have some, uh, some difficulty keeping it that precise. Um, oh, I should change. What am I doing here? Oh, whoa, this is way too big. Let 
like just freestyling with OBS right now. I messed up my, uh, how does it? I guess the stream is a different uh, <laughs> aspect ratio to my camera. Let's see if this is better. Uh, okay, so that's overtones. Now let's talk about undertones or subharmonics. Um, There's a couple different ways we can do it inside of the mannequins modules. Ooh, I wonder if the, the fans really going for it today. Um, the first way we can do it is, is the kind of original way that I kind of came up with, which was just playing around with some old surge module designs. Um, but it's essentially just an oscillator triggering an envelope generator. Um, and this old, the classic surge design has an envelope that doesn't start, it won't uh, re-trigger unless it's completed the attack stage. I think maybe it's actually the whole stage. Um, the whole envelope. Um, but what happens is if you send in a, a kind of a cyclic trigger that's slightly faster than the, the, uh, the rate of the oscillator, uh, it won't, it will basically skip that trigger. And it's that skipping that allows us to kind of explore undertones. So let's listen to it before we kind of get too deep into that realm. Um, so with Mangrove, you, to get clean, clean-ish uh, undertones, you need to set the barrel control counterclockwise. That makes it a, um, a ramp so uh, a ramp wave which is a, a slow rise and then a really quick fall um, which is it's kind of just a, a mirrored sawtooth wave um, and that's what we need because we want to have the attack stage of our envelope be as long as possible um, it sounds the same as a sawtooth but it just changes the behavior so on mangrove you can turn the barrel clockwise you'll get the same sounds but you'll get a different behavior where in this mode you'll get um, undertones. You won't get them if it's clockwise. So let's choose a higher frequency higher frequency because we're gonna go down in frequency rather than up. So have this kind of annoyingly high tone. Is that right? I think so. Um, so what's happening there is Mangrove has an oscillator that's running at the kind of frequency defined by the, the large knob at the top, um, the pitch the pitch knob. And the formant control is setting the speed of an envelope generator. It's an envelope generator that's designed to go really fast, um, like at audio rates, so that you can hear it. Um, but it's just being triggered by the oscillator. So it has a, so the oscillator, it just gives it the, it, it just takes the square wave output um, and uses that to trigger the envelope. So as we stretch out the envelope until it becomes faster than the oscillator, it'll, it'll skip some tones. Um, but yeah, so that, that's how we get that dividing. So if we, if we listen again to the kind of, um, The sequence of tones that you hear, these are the subharmonics off of off of this note. Um, so this is our fundamental. This is an octave down, an octave and a fifth, an octave, uh, two, two octaves? Yeah. And a third, and a fifth, and a seventh, 
three octaves. And then we start to get into microtones. Um, but what's happening there is that's like an inverse of what we just experiment, just what we just saw with um, the overtones. Um, so we can think you can think about that um, when you're when you're hearing uh, the oh, oh this is this is the way I get to use the whiteboard um, when we're doing harmonics we can treat this as just a, as a division this is a ratio over one and so the harmonics become you know. You start at 1 over 1, it becomes 2, then 3, then 4, and what you'll see there is you're just kind of multiplying this, this, this uh, bass frequency. So if you have the fifth harmonic, um, it's a factor of 5, um, which is not going to be an octave up, it's going to be, so 2 octaves would be a factor of 4. Um, Three octaves would be a factor of eight. So five is somewhere between two octaves and three octaves. Um, we'll get into exactly what that's what the ratio that is. I mean, we're, we're describing it as being two octaves and a third. But what is a third uh, is kind of a question that we'll explore later. Similarly, uh, for undertones, it's the same thing, Like on except we're changing the which side? So the harmonics are being fixed at 1. So again, we can go 1, 2, 3, 4, and down to 5. And so let's listen. 2, 3, 4, 5. And here's a trick where you can hear the fundamental by just turning barrel up above noon. So this is our fundamental. And this is our fifth subharmonic. Well, that's considering that the first is the fundamental. Um, and it's hard to maybe hear them next to each other, but it's it is two octaves and a third down, I think. Maybe it's the second. But it has like a minor sound. Um, Let's add a, another oscillator so we can kind of compare the two. has a, a minor sound, but it's still very consonant, it's not dissonant, even though it's minor. Um, So that's one way. Um, but what I want to come back to is this idea that, that this, when we talk about harmonics and subharmonics, we're just talking about a fraction. And we have harmonics on top and subharmonics on the bottom. Uh, you can use other words as well. You can talk about harmonics as being overtones and subharmonics as being undertones. Um, I think that's a maybe a Harry Potterism, um, or maybe I don't know. Um, Peter Blasser from Seattle Lombard and Shabobov and all of that. He he explores the undertone stuff a lot as well. So if you're interested in this, um, checking out some of his writing is really uh, it's a trip. It's like really interesting and like mind expanding and also just bizarre sometimes, um, but in a really beautiful way that I think it's very earnest and it's a really uh, I think 
accessible, which feels really good to me. Um, but we'll just leave this for now. You can also think of it as numerator and denominator if you're, you have like a math background or high school, high school math background. It's not even, it's not serious math, it's just division. Um, okay, so the next thing is let's do, um, oh yeah, um, I'll type in the, look up, you can just Google search for Peter B. Just B. Um, just Google that and you'll find his blog. It's got lots of really interesting stuff on it. Um, okay, so next, that was Mangrove doing subharmonics. Let's do it with Just Friends. Um, so this is cool because it has multiple outputs. Um, we're just going to start with one. Um, oh yeah, so... Okay, apparently my script has something about putting just friends in just type mode. So I have to turn that off quickly. Wow. <laughs> um, oh, I think it thinks it's also in run mode. All right, now we have a, a sine wave. So we're just using Just Friends in sound cycle mode. Um, so that just makes it six oscillators. Um, and the first thing is we can do overtones. All we do is we set the ratio, uh, the intone control to fully counterclockwise. Um, and each output is going to give us the next step up the harmonic series. So this is the, the fundamental, second harmonic, third, fourth, fifth, uh, sixth harmonic. So they're kind of always available to you. Um, now you can um, you can mix the two together. So this is a nice way to explore the sound and the consonants of these notes. Um, so this is just the third harmonic, so it's just an octave, uh, an octave and a fifth, but it's an incredibly consonant sounding octave and a fifth. Um, you can use, instead of the fundamental, you can use the, the second harmonic. And the nice thing about that is the two tones are like closer together, um, but it's just a really nice sounding fifth. Um, I don't have a volume control at the moment, but, um, so this is just two octaves against each other. Which, because they're, they're so tightly linked, it just sounds like a different timbre. It doesn't sound like two separate tones. It's just the presence of an extra kind of more harmonic kind of layer to it. Here's, this is just a fundamental, and then you have that, like, on top. But we can also do more interesting kind of tighter harmonic things. So we can do the, the three and the four, uh, which should give us... something. In general, um, the odd harmonics are going to be where the more interesting sounds are, because the even harmonics um, are more consonant, and the odd ones are more dissonant. Um, they all become dissonant eventually, except the like repeating octaves. Um, but odd ones are going to be more different. So this is five and three together. So it's like a I don't remember what that that free, that's the interval is. But this is kind of how you can explore these really interesting harmonic relationships. Um, 
But yeah, so hearing them against the fundamental. So that's harmonics with Just Friends, but we can do subharmonics too. Um, so to do that, you just turn the intern control fully counterclockwise. Um, and again, we're going to increase the frequency a bit of the fundamental um, in order to um, have kind of audible room for the subharmonics. So. Sounds like there's a ghost in there somewhere. Um, I'm gonna leave the the top note a little bit rolled off so it's not too loud. Um, this is the fundamental, and now we're gonna go down the subharmonic series. An octave down. It's like the, or it's a major third down, so it's a, it's a minor sixth relative to the fundamental. And then another fifth, um, which is a fourth. <laughs> but again, you can start doing these interesting combinations. Where you get ratios, uh, intervals, that are really consonant because they're very closely related mathematically, but they have a minor tonality. So I think it's maybe that just like should like make you stop thinking about minor as being discordant and major as consonant because I don't think that's what they really mean. You can use them that way, but it's an interesting. That's an aside to me. But to me, this is a lovely ratio. I don't know what it is. at once but we're going to use transient mode um, so I'll warn you this one is a little more grainy and has like a digital kind of a digital dust sound um, if you will um, but I think it's still kind of valid and worthwhile to pursue so we're going to start again um, th this is all of the minor harmonics at the same time So that's the kind of realm of notes we're going to get to choose from, but we're going to be able to choose them based on a driving oscillator. Um, so I'm going to use just the square output on a mangrove. I think it'll make things easier. Um, and we're going to... Uh, we'll use the format just so we get... Uh, what's the word? Um, volume control, which is uh, useful. So, uh, what we're doing here is basically turning up uh, the driving oscillator and we're going to use the Just Friends in sound mode still, but it's essentially acting as, a, as really quick envelopes. So it's the same concept as Mangrove, but it's a digital implementation and because of the way it's built um, and the way it executes, it's, it has a grainy quality due to jitter, essentially. Now we change the mangrove frequency. We get some really weird sounds. But somehow this is not what it should be doing. What am I doing wrong? Thank you. 
So this sounds like it's pulsing, but that's actually caused by some frequency locking that's happening between the two, or a phase between them. It's a little strange, but we can continue. feeling I'm not doing this quite right, but persevere with me for one more second and we'll just try and make something that sounds nice. But basically we're going to explore the different, uh, the different kind of sounds you can get out of um, using the undertone series. to forgive me, I feel like I've forgotten this whole patch. If you watch the Just Friends uh, original announcement video, at the end of it there is a patch showing how to do this. Um, you can indeed use the square output. Will it make it better? Maybe that was it. kind of second way of doing subharmonics with just friends. It's not uh, it's not oscillating them directly, 
but it is kind of allowing you to explore the subharmonic range of a driving oscillator. Oh, so one thing we could actually try here. Let's okay. Let's leave this for one second. We're going to plug in the mangrove's main out oscillator out to hear that in relationship. Uh, is not that consonant with the Just Friends output. Um, you know, it's, it's a strange ratio that it's picking up, but um, because of the frequency locking, it kind of has that interesting effect. mentioned before is you can just turn in turn the other direction and as long as the mangrove is tuned lower than just friends or maybe it's the other way around you have to switch which one's higher you can play with the overtones in the same way I think does that make sense maybe not <laughs> the real blues notes in there. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of like what you can do with the uh, all the oscillators, like all the, the those three modules of that I've created. Um, let's do a little bit of scripting now, and what we're going to try and do is figure out how to get that, how to explore that subharmonic. Um, scale, if you will, um, series, uh, with a script. Uh, let's get my big face out of the way here. Okay. Um, I fully intended to, like, rewrite, to write this before we did it, but I, um, have forgotten had forgotten to. I definitely made it at some point. So if we fail, we'll have something to look at uh, to kind of figure out what the answer is. Okay. Um, J.I. Is that it? Ooh, love that. Okay, so if we fail, we have some backup. Um, oh, the great mug. Yeah, this is... The lovely Kelly Kane. Uh, it was a birthday present. Um, okay, so let's make let's make a new file for today's Twitch. I'm gonna call it subs just for the sake of my typing, not having to take too long. Back onto the post-it note. Um, and what we're going to be running is um, subs.lua. So this is, Druid is above me here. Um, and so what this is doing is we're just controlling the Crow module. It's in the case here. We have a really long USB cable. Um, and I'm just going to be kind of uploading the script that we're writing there, up here, <laughs> using Druid over here. Um, so at the moment, um, Are we in the wrong? No, that should be right. At the moment, our uh, script is empty, so it's not running anything. But 
let's begin. So what we're going to try and write is like a subharmonic um, generator. Or subharmonic pitch source. Let's start with that. Um, this is going to challenge the tuning on my oscillators, which will probably fail at some point. Um, but let's begin. So we always, typically with these, we always start with an init function. I don't know what's going to go in it yet, but this is where we're going to start whatever we would want to do. Um, so my concept, my idea here is we're going to um, sequence a mangrove oscillator from Crow. Well, a sequence is too strong of a word. We're going to control the pitch of this mangrove. Um, with CV from Crow, from our, from our script. And so we're going to need to listen to the mangrove. So that's our tone that we're going to work with. Um, and from there we're going to uh, divide down octaves. Um, so in order to begin that, we're inside of our init, we're just going to send a, a pitch out. So let's start with a voltage of zero. So this should be identical to what's already happening. Okay, and so it's running um, as is. So we can actually do this in Druid. Um, what we want to do is we want to have minus one is the first subharmonic. Um, then we want to go to it's not one and a half. If we do it as uh, ratios, uh, so it will talk, we'll, we'll treat this as like uh, semitones. So this will be equal temperament. Um, it won't be as nice as we've been getting these like really perfectly tuned things, but we'll get to that later. So originally we had zero. Then we want to go minus 12, which is an octave down. We want to go minus. 19, which is 12 plus 7, so 7 is a fifth. We want to keep going down to 24. Uh, here it gets interesting. Uh, maybe... I think it's actually 28. 31. 30... I think this is the issue, it's in between the, those two notes, to be correct. And then finally we get down three octaves down. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the sequence we're trying to create. Let's, let's, um, let's write that in our script here, in a comment. So we want 0, minus 12, minus 19, minus 24, minus 28, minus 31, Minus 30... We want to get to minus 36. But before that... Needs to be... I think it's minus... 33.5. <laughs> um, so, we need to create a... Uh, function... That can give us those values. Or maybe it'll be those values multiplied by uh, divided by 12. Um, because that's the kind of actual output voltage. Um, so the spoiler is we need to use a logarithm. Um, and kind of getting these uh, ratios just right is kind of about figuring out what that, alg that, that equation is. Uh, I think the best thing for us to do here is cheat, because this is a solved problem. Uh, we don't need to figure it out from scratch. I, I'm not a mathematician myself. Um, so I look at that and I'm like, I'll put it into a graph and look and see what it looks like. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to open up um, this file, which I was writing as like a, a prototype of um, a potential extension to the Crow standard library, but it's not finished yet. But the, in the important part is... Um, what does this do? Convert just ratios to volts per octave. 
I'm going to cheat by just copying the whole function, going back to our file, paste it in. Uh, and I don't want to use this whole thing yet, because I, I know this is overly complicated. Um, so I know for a fact we don't need any, uh, any of this. Um, we don't need to worry about an offset. All we need to worry about is this. Okay, so we need it. We need a very specific constant. Um, which is the value of math.log of two. Oh, I should have to print that in this. Um, I think we actually need one divided by this number, which is this magical number 1.443, essentially. Um, So let's just for argument's sake, so we don't have to think about it, let's just call it magic. And we're gonna make this one divided by math.log of two. Don't worry too much about that, that's just a number we need. But uh Yes. So that's what this LD2 is here. So that's really just gonna become magic. And we're not worrying about an offset, because that's a, a separate issue that was I was thinking about separately. Um but we have this magical equation now, which is just the log of f. I'll explain what f is in a sec. Multiplied by this magic number. Um, so I believe f should be um, a ratio. It's a floating point number that's a ratio. So that means that if it was, that it could be one, uh, which would be probably the unison. But then we can kind of move from there. So let's try. Let's upload this um, script into Crow. So that's uploaded correctly. So now we have access to all this stuff um, in Druid. So I now should be able to write print of, we're gonna call just faults with a ratio of one over one. Ooh, love this. Oh, there's no off listed here. I clearly forgot to save it. There we go. Okay, so a ratio of one over one um, gives us a voltage of zero. Now, just to get us started, let's try one over two. It's minus one. So that's going to be the octave we were talking about before. If we multiply this by 12, we should be getting a number really close to the list that we put into our script. So that's one over two. One over three is gonna be about 19. Four is 24. Five is about 20, about minus 28. Six is 31. Did we get this 33, right? Yeah, 33.68. And then 36. Okay, so that's the magic, um, but it's just, it's just a logarithm of a number divided by another number. Is that, is that too strange? Um, and that kind of fundamentally comes back to the idea that we, volt per octave is a, is a exponential scale, but these ratios we're talking about are referencing the linear frequency. So we have to do the inverse of an exponential, which is a logarithm, um, in order to be uh, in the right kind of territory. So um, why are we using a fraction um, up here? And that's back to this on the whiteboard. So we've been changing, we've been changing the subharmonic number um, in order to get those descending um, subharmonics. But in exactly the same way, we can we can just change the number on top. So if we go with two over one, um, or three over one, we're doing we're getting the exact same number, but it's positive, positive. Um, and that's going to become in real handy in just a moment. But let's listen to some of these um, intervals. Uh, let's make a real 
Okay, really quickly, I'm just going to make a sequencer. <laughs> Love this. So, time. So this is just so we don't have to kind of manually do everything. Um, the event is going to be next step. Uh, so every time a sequencer hits, I want to basically descend down the... Um, we want to go down the subharmonics. So how do we do that? We're going to set the output of channel 1, its voltage, to be equal to the result of this fancy function just volts. Um, and here we need to have some ratio, right? Something over something. Um, now, we need to have a variable that we can sequence. So we're going to say um, what should we call it? I'm going to use, let's call it undertone. I'm going to start with the value of 1. So let's say 1 over the undertone. Um, and so the first time it executes it's going to be the value 1. But each time we execute, we want to we want to go up. Uh, we want to like increment which undertone we're addressing, which should send us down the subharmonic frequency, um, the subharmonic series rather. So undertone equals undertone minus one. This will very quickly run out of audible range, but I think that for our purposes we should be fine. always love when I hit start and nothing happens. Mm. Next step. Help anywhere? Function only takes one param. We are passing two. Oh, thank you. Whoa, that wasn't happy. Oh, I subtracted one, we have to go up. So that just tried to do a division by zero. Okay, so we're down, we're down in the depths of the subharmonic range. Um, and that's, that's basically hit minus 5 volts, which is as low as crow can go. So it's 5 octaves down from the, the fundamental. Um, okay, so we can restart it by just setting undertone back to 1. So those are the undertones. That's really cool. We can control that. What a, we can also control that directly with a control voltage. So um, we'll use one of the Myriad cold max, and I'm going to use this control to directly set um, the undertone value. So we're going to turn this sequencer off. Um, by just stopping the metro, because we're going to brick, we're going to come back to that sequencer, um, and instead I'm going to set input one um, to be stream mode. Rather, we're going to do it. We're going to do it uh, a different way. So there's a number of different ways you can set up the inputs, but um, they're all just different kind of syntactic sugar for the same fundamental thing. But I want to. Um, we can do one millisecond. I want to basically uh, query it as quickly as possible. Uh, let's say two. I think that's as fast as it can actually work. Um, and the way that works is basically now to define another function. Um, we have to write this differently. We have to... Uh, 
input one dot stream. So this is basically the function that will get called every time um, this 0 0.002 millisecond timer from line 10. Um, basically every time that timer happens, this function will get called with the voltage on the first input. Um, we want to take that voltage and let's say we want to have access to the first... Uh, 13 is a good number for a number of reasons. Um, the first 13 subharmonics. Uh, so this is... the cold max is going to give us roughly 10 volts um, of range. So let's take that. We will... this is the V value. Um, I want to add 5 volts. Um, so that's going to give us a 0 to plus 10 range. Um, we want to multiply that by 1.3. So that's going from from 0 to 10. We're going to multiply it up to 0 to 13. Um, and then we need to add 1 to that whole thing so that we start at 1. Um, and now we need to do something with that voltage. So I'm just going to... Oh, we can just overwrite. So I'm just going to update the value of V to be this kind of manipulated version. So this is convert negative 5 to 5 into 1. So I guess that's going to be to 14, 13? I don't know. Um, so that's just like a mapping of one range to another range. Um, Now we have to do something. So I think all we have to do is copy this line. Oh, we need to... That's given us a floating point number, so a continuous number between 1 and 13. What we actually need is a quantized version of that. We need to have only integers. We had to figure this out last time, and I still don't remember how to do it. Um, does anybody know in the comments? 1 to 14, thank you. Um, if you don't know, I'm going to have to Google it again. Alright, we could do... You could use math.floor. Will that work? That should work, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I hope this is right. Let's see. Oh, we did the plus 0.5. I don't think we need it this time because that's just going to change what the offset on the knob is. So it's probably okay as is, but maybe, maybe it won't be. Um, so... <laughs> So my question is, is that, uh, is that the fundamental? Pretty close. Um, okay, so now we have a, a physical control that goes down the subharmonic range. We could flip that if it would make things easier um, to the textual reason about, but um, let's just try it as is. So, gonna go to a high frequency. Love it. Okay, um, the fun thing is that this is almost identical to do the, doing the exact same thing with overtones. Um, so to do that, uh, I'm going to basically copy what we just did, except we're going to use a second cold Mac, and we're going to um, apply it as the numerator on our fraction, the overtone, rather than the undertone that we were using. Um, I think that's all I had to do. Love it. So, now uh, we need to write a tiny bit of code. Um, so all we have to do extra here 
is pull in the value of the input. Um, the, it's the second input. So we can just say input 2.volts, and that's going to give us the same voltage, the same kind of voltage as the first channel. We're going to need to um, manipulate it in the same way. Um, so if you want to be a stickler about um, optimize or about uh, abstraction, we could say process v. This is a dumb name for the function, but um, it's going to return basically this. So now instead of this whole thing here, we got to just cut that out, and instead this v becomes process v of v. <laughs> Oop. Apologies. Syntax error. What did I get wrong? Am I missing some parens? Oh, this isn't correct yet. So, does this still work? Sounds good. Um, So all we have to do is take this input voltage and we need to process it with that same function to kind of put it into the right range. It'll be 1 to 13. Um, and we're going to make this a local variable, um, which is over time. And so the, the lovely thing here is all we have to do is change. So this was 1, this, this number here. Uh, and so that's basically saying that the numerator is 1, the, the overtone is the overtone number 1. But instead we can just change that to be this new value, overtone. And this should give us um, overtone control. So that's great, then we have undertones, still working. They're very low frequency. And now we get to use them together. And you get into all kinds of weird junk. Um, so I, so that's going to give you a whole bunch of different tones, and they're all related to the frequency of the mangrove. They're all related to to this. Um, but what you're doing there is basically creating all kinds of weird ratios of different numbers. Um, so. What I want to show is how they relate um, to the... how they relate as kind of musical intervals back to the fundamental. And to do that, I'm going to do the same thing where we have a, a second oscillator, which is just a reference tone, so we can hear what we're comparing against. Realistically, they're going to drift a little bit because it's analog and that's the nature of the oscillator. But we'll get the, we'll get the effect. Um, so, if this is our fundamental, I'm going to keep it pretty low in volume so we can focus on the interval. Um, we can now set interval ratios back to this, this tone. So this is just some subharmonics. We have an octave down, octave north, octave north. So this is 
1 over 1. 2 over 1. 2 over 2. 3 over 2. I have this upside down, I'm really sorry. Oh, we can change that. Okay, so now the numerator is here, the overtone. The undertone is down here, the denominator. So this is 3 over 3. Uh, we can do 3 over 4. Or 3 over 2. They're both a fifth. Um, and it's like a perfect fifth in a very literal sense. Um, but you can also do some more, you can get like a bit, bit weirder with it. Um, 4 over 3? This is like a 4th? My knowledge of what these ratios, what these tones are, uh, is going to run out very quickly. Um, but 5 over 4? This is a major 3rd, right? Seven over four. Seven over five. Eight over five. Six. Eight over seven. Some I somehow love this. I'm not sure why. Nine over seven is like weirdly consonant. And at this point I'm just playing around because I don't know... It's very difficult to be like, oh, this is my ratio and this is what it is. I feel like two knobs is not the best interface for that. But it's an interesting way to explore the sounds. Um, and I think one thing that could be really cool is if we kind of um, slewed from these numbers two different numbers. Um, and I think that's where we, I want to go next, is I basically want to talk about um, kind of like using, using ratios as your kind of note values rather than um, numbers as a fraction of 12, you know, as we have been using with like 0, 4, 7, 11, that kind of thing. And an idea I had before, before we started this is I wanted to do to basically be able to say, oh, I like the 5 over 4 ratio, and I like the 8 over 7 ratio. And I want to slew between them, but not as like a pitch to a pitch. I want to slew as the numbers in the, the numerator and denominator. I want them to slew. So when we go from 5 over 4 to 8 over 7, we're going to go through uh, 6 over 5, 7 over 6 and then get to 8 over 7. Um, so we can do it in a very, you know, like a, a kind of basic programmatic way. Um, so this is not going to use anything fancy in Crow. This is just going to use um, a, I guess we'll do like a, an RC filter, uh, essentially a one pole low pass filter, um, which I'm going to try and wrap into this process v function. I think that makes sense. So this processor is not only going to change the mapping of input to output, it's also going to apply a um, going to apply a slew. So to do that we have to change a couple of things. The first is we need to know which um, index we're addressing. And so that's just so that we can have a separate um, slew for each of them because they have to remember some, they have to remember some, they have to have, they have to have some memory to remember 
the state of the slew. Um, that should become apparent shortly. Uh, the overtones will call one and the undertones will call two. And so up here we're going to have a variable of slew, which is a table. Um, and this is going to be just two numbers. We'll, we'll deal with what they are in a second. Um, but the idea here is we want to um, remember the previous state um, each time. And so this is, this is just a, a linear interpolation between the previous state and the new state. So how we'll do that is, I don't remember this off the top of my head, so I'll just kind of work, work through it. Hopefully we'll figure it out. Um, and a lot of it will be redundant, but um, the new value is just going to equal the v that we calculated. And so there's our new, so this, we'll call this input, uh, which we can't because we have a thing called input. We'll call it underscore input. Um, and then we'll call, uh, we'll have an output, which is going to be some interpolation between the new value and the old value. Um, and then after we figured out that interpolation, so we'll have some unknown here, uh, we're then going to store it into the, going to kind of store it as the old, uh, as the new old value. Um, so slew of index will equal underscore output. And then we want to return the output. Uh, input to output. Okay, so here we should be able to say, um, the coefficient is zero. We want to save the old. Okay, so we have the old value let's make another variable just for clarity of like what things are. So old plus um, rate uh, let's call it 0 0.5 for now. Rate multiplied by um, new oh, input minus old. So this is linear interpolation and sets the slew rate. So this number is between 0 and 1. Um, and it's going to control how fast we go. Zero is going to make it, it's going to go infinitely slow, which will mean you'll never get a change. Whereas one will mean you'll get instant change. Um, so we're going to say 0.5. That's going to be way too much, um, but let's hear it first. Um, make sure this is actually working. I don't think there's anything totally wrong with that. Let's try it out. It either isn't doing anything, or it's just too fast that we can't hear it. So let's go down. Okay, so this is working, but uh, one thing you might notice, we can slow it down even further, um, is it's slewing on the way to the new value, but it's doing it continuously. It's not going through those stages. So we need to put, if what we want to do is kind of slew by stepping, we have to put the slew before the, um, before deciding what the destination value is. So to do that, we might actually have to do it on both sides, which will be frustrating, but let's see what happens. Um, back down for a sec. Um, so we need to take... I think we can leave this first conversion. So this is just changing our range, but it's the thing that like create makes it an integer. Um, might need to be done at the start and the end, or maybe just only the end. So let's copy it and paste it down here. So this is going to need to be operating on the output. Um, 
but let's try this. Okay, so that's great. It sounds like it's working to me. Um, I think what will make this fun now is if we make it a sequencer rather than two direct knobs. Let's just input a sequence of ratios um, and work from there. Let's see what happens. Um, I think that these two lines are going to essentially the they're the kind of core of what we're doing here. Um, so I could just call this function, but it would make things look weird. So I'm just going to copy it um, and paste it into the next step function. So we're going to turn our sequencer back on. Um, and we're going to turn off reading the inputs, just because we're not using them anymore. Um, So, I think we can delete these, or like we'll just comment them out so they're here for posterity. Um, and then let's remember what we're doing. Okay, so uh, rather than, so in here, we're querying these two values. Um, and we're calling this process function. The issue here is this the processing is. Uh, doing a bunch of conversions we don't actually care about. Um, oh yeah, we're updating at 2 milliseconds. The fastest you can theoretically go with the inputs is 1.5 milliseconds. I don't know if it will work. Anything faster than that, you won't get extra information. It'll just be copies of the same value. That's the kind of sampling rate. Um, that aside, let's um, get this running. Okay, so we just built this like big fancy process function, and I feel like we need to do a sep another one. Um, I'm just gonna copy it. Oh, what happened there? And just for clarity, I'm gonna comment that whole thing out. So this is. Um, using the inputs to control okay but here we have a different we're still going to have a process v function it's a it's a dumb name I'm really sorry for that um, and we're going to delete everything that isn't the slew and the quantize I think that means we can keep the same process v function. Why don't we call it um, slew? Except we can't. Um, <laughs> let's just leave it. Never mind. Um, that's everything. The only, the only issue here is we no longer need to be using our input values, um, because next step doesn't have any input. Instead, we're going to, we'll use a table of ratios. Uh, so to do that, let's make an example. So we have a sequencer, which is a table. And it's going to have to be a table of tables. And that's because we want each element in our sequencer to be a ratio. And the best way to represent a ratio um, is going to be as two uh, as two separate ones. So we could do it a couple of different ways. We can do a sequence of ratio pairs. That's what this is going to be to start. Sequence of pairs of ratios. Um, and then after that, we're going to do two sequences of 
Uh, we're going to do independent um, sequences for um, overtone and U-tone, un overtone, undertone, harmonic, subharmonic, numerator, denominator, all the different names. Um, and so that it will get us to do some like really weird but interesting stuff. Um, but let's start with just a, a sequence of ratios. So let's start with one over one. And so I'm using a comma here just because they're, we're separating them in the table. So we can't do the division. We could just save the floating point representation of the division, but I think it, um, it maybe feels better because this way we can have an independent slew for each, each side. Um, yeah, so we get to, that's exactly what we want. We want to be able to slew independently based on the numerator or denominator. So there's two slews running in parallel. Uh, so we're 1, 1, someone like 5, 4, I like 8, 7, and then let's go to a bigger one, like 11 over 8, a nice perfect fifth, um, and then, what's another one? Someone want to throw one at me? What do you like? We can do... Let's just do an octave. Um, and we're gonna, basically we're just going to step through these six values in our next step function. And so we need to we're going to have a sequence index. We're going to start at one. Um, and we want basically we're going to say seek of one. So seek at seek index. This is going to be our numerator, and this is our denominator. So we just did this before. Okay, so we've reused that name, we can't do that. Um, but basically both of these, we need to process V then. And this is gonna be as index one, and this is as index two. And then all we should have to do is divide the overtone by the undertone and apply that to just faults. That should work once, but then we have to make it cycle. Um, so to do that, we say seek x equals seek x. We're just going to sequence through sequentially. So we go uh, modulo by the length of seek plus one. So that's what it is. It's if it makes it clearer, this happens first. Or well, this happens first, actually. The, the length of the seek. So this is saying. Uh, this is just, just a, a, a kind of idiom of saying um, increment our index and wrap to the table length, to length of seek. Let's try it out. Ooh. So something's not right. Let's debug. So the way I do that is I make sure that our sequence number is correct. Two, three, four, five, six, one. Okay, so that's working fine. Um, let's check what the value of this is. All right, so this is this is failing, probably because we're doing a divide by zero. Um, so why would that be? Did I comment? No, it's just still here. Okay. Um, I'm going to print undertone because we're getting an NAN means we're failing to divide, which is probably a um, 
probably a divide by zero. Um, so we're probably going to see zero here. This is our problem. Okay. Um, let's try and print. I'm going to see if it's the process v function that's at fault here by saying seek of seek x um, of two. Okay, so this is reading our values out of the table and they seem correct. Um, so it looks like there's something wrong happening in the process v function. So let's look at that function. Oh, sorry. Where are we? Okay, here we go. Um, so perhaps it's because the slew is somehow not existing. Did we create another variable called slew? No, this one's strange to me. I'm gonna try the good old reset. Are we still getting? All right, we still have this problem. Does somebody want to debug for me? Um... Process V is for some reason failing when this number is two. Okay, let's put it in here. Um, let's say print slew index. Oh, there we go. It's getting a totally bizarre number. Oh no, it's, it's printing out the value. This seems correct. Sorry, I'm like spinning out right here. What is going on? So slew index is correct. Oh, we're calling this we're starting at such a small value because we're only doing this. The issue is we're running a timer that is trying to, it's like basically telling it to do all this stuff, um, but it's only happening every time the timer occurs. So what we need is another timer to basically run the slew engine. Um, and rather than set the output directly from here, we're going to be continuously updating the output from a fast timer that's basically just executing the slew. Um, this became a little more complicated than I expected, but let's try it out anyway. So we're going to go again the two millisecond timer. Um, we're going to say bang outputs. Um, and then we'll start that. Cool. Okay. Um, Okay, so next step is kind of just setting, all we want this function to do is set new destinations for the slews. Um, so I think the, the best way to do that is to have these two variables be uh, global variables. So we were currently using this undertone one up here. Let's change that. Let's just have Overtone equals zero. I mean, we can actually leave, we can leave this as is. So we, we're just gonna have, we're gonna have these global variables, overtone and undertone. And the job of next step is just going to be to calculate new values for those. Um, it will also be to increment the sequence, but we're not actually gonna output anything here. We're gonna reserve this function um, 
and we're going to call it in, what do we call that function? Bang outputs. Let's write that. Uh, I think that might actually be process v. Oh, this is, this is getting even better. So bang outputs. Um, well, let's leave it because we need to basically call that function. Oh no, I lost my copy. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So all this function should do is output a single value and it's going to happen really quickly. Um, and essentially that's just going to call this just vaults over overtone undertone, except those values need to be the slewed version of those. Um, so that's going to mean, uh, sorry, this has gotten a little bit out of control, but, uh, Hopefully we'll be making some great sounds in just a moment. That probably won't, won't even like that. Okay. Um, so we're just going to update this. And so that means up here, we don't even need to set, uh, we don't need to call this process function. All we have to do is this. And hopefully this works because otherwise we'll have to start all over. So we have a very strange sequencer. Which is sequencing through a set of just intonation ratios. Um, um, relative to this frequency on the second on the second mangrove. Um, we're printing whatever ratio we're up to above. Um, but finally we got there. I'm sorry, that was a that was an odyssey of figuring this out. Um, I'm certain there's a much nicer way to do this, but it does seem like it's uh, achieving our goal. Why don't we slow things down a little bit to hear the kind of the weird um, quantization that's happening? Um, some sound. I, I don't know if you can call it music, but it's it's some sound.
I guess you could go into like some weird atonal territory by Now I'm changing I'm going into the subharmonics on the reference oscillator. kind of uh, sweeping through the formant of the second mangrove to kind of slide through a bunch of different subharmonics and then running the first mangrove with the sequence from up here. It needs to be slowed down to sonor speed, absolutely. Maybe I can get some direction from y'all. Um, we could do the idea that I, that I was mentioning before, um, up uh, somewhere. This idea. So, another idea that we could kind of build is making the sequencer independently sequence the overtone and the undertone. And that would allow, um, Rather than sequencing known ratios, which are like pitches, it's like I want this pitch. Um, instead, you could kind of sequence through like, oh, I want to use threes and fives and sevens um, as numerators, but denominators could just be uh, maybe even numbers. Um, it's probably not that difficult to add that where we are from where we are. But I might save this and. We'll make essentially a copy, um, just so we don't lose all of the details from that. Um, let's try and do it really quickly. Um, I think it'll be really simple. All we need is like two separate sequences and two separate uh, indexes into those sequence sequences. So let's call this. Um, o tone x, and this will be the O tone table. And then we'll have a U tone table, which will make it a different length, just to kind of show some phasing stuff. Put three in there. So I think all we have to do is change these two lines. Oh, and change, add one of these. So instead of what we're calling seek x before, we're now making that be for each one. So hey. What is going on? U-tone, U-tone, U-tone X, O-tone X, and we no longer need to sub-index inside of those.
So again, we we've we've been using phasing a lot in these different um, these different streams, and so this is using it in a totally different way. This is using phasing to basically change the notes. Um, so we're slowing really slowly right now. We could speed that up to. I'm sure somebody will hate me for doing this, but. And again, we're seeing the ratios right here, so you can see what the actual tone you're hearing is. Someone was asking about slewing the slewing two of or sequencing them at different rates. Absolutely, we can use another metro. Seeing as we're already gone wild with them, let's go again. Zero point, my favorite. Somebody lol it calling that function next next step because that was stupid. I guess we should print in both cases. That was a great idea. Who do I have to thank? It's me, Aflo. Yeah, thank you. So now they're phasing and phasing in time and in count. about Mangrove is it has this extra switch which is the constant formant switch. And in this context like you can sometimes get uh, you can get notes that are really high and really low that are kind of out of range but if you put it in constant formant mode it has the natural quality of restricting the range and sometimes when you go for too high of a note or too low of a note it becomes kind of chaotic, like similar to when you're like playing a saxophone or playing some wind instrument and you overblow too hard, you kind of can get a squeak or you can get kind of thing like tones that aren't the right tone. <laughs> At least when I was playing sax, that definitely happened a lot. Um, but it sounds nice to me, I like this. Uh, I don't have the sax anymore, alas. It's back in Australia. So one thing I was intending to mention before, um, in the kind of introduction section of this whole episode, was like, um, Mangrove is great for doing those undertone things, but it's really interesting because um, there's a lot of kind of chaotic territory where you're in the pitch division process, but um, 
it's either like not quite all the way to the next turn, um, and the way you get there is by using the barrel control, not all the way counterclockwise. Um, I'm really sorry that I had to pull that out, but just to demonstrate, this is a fundamental. Oh, ooh, it was down an octave. <laughs> um, But if we go right to the edge where it drops down, we just go past it, and now we turn barrel back clockwise. You got the in-between note. Which to me is really pretty, and you can get them so this is just between an octave and an octave down, but you can get it between any of the subharmonics. There's some some reason, I don't actually know why this happens, but sometimes it'll drop an extra subharmonic down for an unknown reason. These controls are super interactive. Um, there's a lot of territory that you can kind of dial into, and sometimes it can be hard to get back there. But like this tone here is like between between two subharmonics. And it can be really cool if you're sequencing formant and barrel with really small ranges. Um, you can find a lot of cool stuff. A lot of junk, too. Um, I think that's that's kind of everything I wanted to run through today. Um, I feel like this has been fun. We kind of got some very strange sounds out of it, but uh, I feel good about it. Um, but yeah, I'll post all the, the gists of everything so you can kind of refer back to the scripts we made. Um, the videos are available on YouTube, like, pretty quickly after. It takes me half an hour to get everything together. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have any more questions, let me know. Um, I'll be here for the next 10 minutes, but um, yeah, thanks to everybody for tuning in. These have been like a fun thing to look forward to every week. Uh, forewarning, next week's show might be a bit quick. It's my partner's birthday, so I don't want to stress the relationship. <laughs> um, but yeah, let me know. Let me know any questions, any thoughts. Thanks again. If you wanna, if you wanna sample any of the sound from any of this stuff, please do. It's uh, I think it's all in CC license on YouTube, but like, you have my blessing.